Good morning. morning. I want to welcome each of you to Hill Country Bible Church and those who are joining us new or maybe new to church. uh, We're so glad to have you with us today. Uh, And I want to start off with a question. And my question is, how many of you talk to God? Almost everybody talks to God. We call that prayer. That's pretty common. So this is a more difficult question. How many of you hear God speaking back to you? Okay, we've got some, but less than the first one. I would just say to you, of all the questions I get in ministry, one of the most common questions is, why doesn't God just talk to me? Especially when people are facing difficult decisions or maybe going through suffering, and they're asking the question, why can't I just hear God's voice? Why doesn't he just speak to me? Why doesn't he just say it right to me? So I could be clear in what he wants for me to do. And that's a legitimate question to be asking. In fact, we see him doing that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he spoke directly to Moses. In the New Testament, directly to the Apostle Paul. And we've heard stories, most of us, about God speaking in extraordinary ways. For example, the Scottish-American pastor, uh, Peter Marshall, who became the chaplain of the Senate back in the 1900s, uh, he, was, he was from Great Britain, and, and one night he was in England, and he was traveling by foot from one place to another, and he decided to cut through the moors in the midst of the darkness and the fog that associated, because he was trying to get, get to the place he was going as quickly as he could. It was dark, dank, and kind of nasty, so he took the shortcut. Now, there was a major limestone quarry that was abandoned along the way, but anyway, he decided to go, and so he's walking along in the midst of the dark, kind of having a difficult time seeing ahead, and he hears his name, Peter. He looks around. What? Who's there? Nothing. Takes a couple more steps, and he hears it again. Peter! Peter! What? Who's there? Nothing. He takes another step and stumbles and lands on his knees. And when he puts his hands out to push himself back up, he realizes there's nothing there. In fact, he begins to feel. He goes all the way around and realizes that he'd come right to the edge of a small precipice that was descending into the quarry. Had he taken another step, he would have died. And God was calling his name to get his attention. And I hear a story like that, and I go, whoa! Like, God, why don't you do that for me? Like, I I would like you, like, if I'm starting to go in the wrong direction, just shout my name, call it out. And so many of us kind of struggle with, like, how come God doesn't speak directly to me like that? Well, I've got good news for you today. Uh, We're going to look at a passage of Scripture that's going to help us understand how God speaks. And when you feel like God is silent, what you do about that. So if you grab your Bible or your smartphone and open it to Psalm 19, we're going to look at this incredible psalm today. And while you're turning there, we are spending our summer in the Psalms. We've been taking a psalm each week because the psalms are the songbook of the people of God expressing our emotions, our desires, our dreams, our concerns. And each week we're looking at a challenge that we face and looking at a psalm and asking the question, how do we take this psalm and incorporate it into our lives? We know that summer is a time when people take a vacation from the grind and the the busyness of your life, and we don't want you to take a vacation from God this summer. We want you to take a vacation with God this summer. And so we're going through a psalm, and then we're giving you a spiritual practice. So last week we were wrestling with, what do I do when I feel like I don't experience the love of God? I'm wondering does God love me? And we looked at Psalm 103. We walked through it and we looked at the three habits David practices to be reminded of the love of God. And then we gave everybody an assignment to do this week. And I did it all week and I had a wonderful week. And the assignment was really simple. Just share with somebody every day, just one person, how God's love has been present in your life, like how you've experienced God's love. So I started last Sunday right here 
telling you that God's shown his love to me by giving me 38 years of marriage to Cindy. And we just celebrated our anniversary. So that was an example of that. Thank you. Thank you. I know you're clapping for her because she's endured 38 years. But, and then during the week, I, I was talking to an attorney and I shared with him, God's shown his love toward me in a way that he's provided financially for my, my family and I over the years. And so that, that was real encouraging. And then I shared with one of my coworkers how I was struggling because there was an issue that I needed help with and God dropped a ministry resource in my lap that it fit perfectly with, with what I needed. And I was sharing with this, this ministry, this, this person in ministry, coworker, how God shows his love toward me because he shows up in these really unusual ways from time to time. And so all week long, I've just been experiencing the fullness of God's love because I practiced listening, paying attention, and then speaking about what God does. So we're going to look at Psalm 19. And then I'm going to give you a spiritual practice to practice this week, and I would encourage you to do it because it will change your week. It will change your life. So the question is, when God seems silent, what do I do? In Psalm 19, David begins by telling us, what I do is I listen to God's voice in nature. I listen to God's voice in nature. God is speaking all the time, and he uses nature. Now, uh, uh, let's dive into the psalm. As we work through it, I just want you to just let you know that literary critics who evaluate people's skill, this particular psalm puts David in the category of a world-class poet, musician, lyricist with this poem. It's just a phenomenally beautiful poem. I wish you could read it in Hebrew. Then you'd be able to pick up the meter and the rhyme and all that's with it. But we'll do the best we can to work through it in English because I know you don't want to hear Hebrew this morning. So here we go. It starts out with these words. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. In other words, the heavens, that's the universe, is speaking. The skies are speaking. They're proclaiming. They're pointing out something really important just by their very presence. In fact, the poetic use of these phrases, they declare, they proclaim, these are big words for announcing or heralding or shouting it out. And both of them are continuous verbs. They're talking they're shouting, they're proclaiming, and they keep doing it, and they keep doing it, and they keep doing it. Whenever a human walks out under the canopy of the universe, something is being said. Now, what is being said? They declare the glory of God and the works of his hands. Now, the glory of God is the greatness, the bigness, the amazing nature, and when you look at what God has made, you learn more about who he is. Now, we get this concept, it's really easy to get. You go to a wedding and you see just this fantastic, beautiful, and scrumptious wedding cake, and you think of the baker. Who baked that? For those of you who are into technology, you, you, you pull up an app or a software program and like this just does work well, elegant. And you think of the programmer, the one who programmed it. You pick up a novel and you read it and you weep your way through it. And you think of the author of the novel. You see, the works of somebody's hands point back to something about the quality, the character, the personality of the one who did it. And when we look at the universe, when we look at the skies, when we look at nature, David says, God is speaking to us. In fact, when you go back and look at the history of modern science, Scientists that laid the foundation for most of what we know today and what we build on of scientific knowledge were actually studying nature because of their motivation to understand God. And I want you to give you an example of that 
of this, but before I give an example of it, I just want to ask you, how many of you failed calculus? <laughs> or failed it, or you're struggling with it? Physics? Difficult time with that? Well, this is the guy who invented calculus. He was the guy that laid out the three big laws of motion that lay the foundation for physics. This is the guy who actually worked on the principles of universal gravitation. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Sir Isaac Newton, here's what he wrote. He said, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. So when the teacher or professor tells you that intelligent design is not a legitimate way of understanding how the universe came together and all the information in it, you don't have to argue with them. Just remind them that they're arguing with Newton. <laughs> okay? They're arguing with Newton. He goes on to say, this being governs all things. Now notice, not as the soul of the world. In other words, when he looks at the universe and when he calculates mathematically all the dynamics that are going on, he's saying the universe is not within itself creating and causing the sustainability and the complexity of itself. He says, not as the soul of the world, but as the Lord over all, and on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God, or a custom to be called Lord God. What's he saying? He's saying that when I look at the complexity of the world and the universe, and I understand how all of these things work together, like, I know that there is someone behind this who has power and intelligence and design and meaning and purpose behind all of that. That's the foundation of really all of our scientific discovery. And so that's simply what the psalmist is saying. What David is saying is, look, at you look around at what God's made and you begin to understand a little bit because God's speaking through what he's made. Look what he says in verse 2. He says, day after day they, that's the heavens, the skies, they pour forth speech. Night after night they display, so they're speaking, they display, now they show knowledge. This is abundant, it's just coming and coming and coming all the time. He says, there is no language or speech where their voice is not heard, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. In other words, this is universal communication. It communicates in English, it communicates in French, it communicates in German, it communicates in Hindi, it communicates in Farsi, it communicates in Mandarin, in Uzbek. It communicates in all languages because no matter what language a person on the planet speaks, they all can walk out into nature and observe the same thing. The amazing glory of the Creator and derive from looking at what He has made, the works of His hands, many things about who He is. And then He gives a specific example. He says, in the heavens, he's pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion. Like a champion rejoicing to run his course, it rises at one end of the heaven and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The universal experience of humanity globally is the sun makes its way through the day. And we experience that. There's no place on the planet that doesn't have the effect of the sun. This is a universal thing. In fact, using poetry, David actually personifies the sun like a bridegroom who is joyfully running to his bride or like a champion who's joyfully running into the victory. Like the, he's saying the creation in the way it operates actually celebrates the creator. Actually celebrates the creator. The challenge is if you just look at nature and you don't pay attention to what nature's saying 
you miss it. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the great poet, writes these words. She says, earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. Like, nature's speaking all the time, but if you're not listening, you're not looking, you're not going to stand in awe. Like Moses, who saw the burning bush in the desert, went closer and found out that God was actually speaking to him, trying to get his attention. Now, this is very important that we as humans pause to recognize that God is speaking to us. In fact, the Apostle Paul says it really, really definitively in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who, watch this word, suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. What do you mean? Like people who are rejecting God? God's already shown them himself? How? He goes on to say, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, this is what you can see from creation, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. He says our failure as the human race to recognize him because of what he's made, that is a huge problem for humanity. And I would say for many of us, we don't stop for even a moment in the midst of the natural world to ponder the author of the national, natural world. So we miss God speaking to us, and he's speaking to you every day. So let me give you some practical help with this. What I would encourage you to do is get outside. And you're looking at me and saying it's 103 degrees outside. <laughs> well, like, you know, there are periods of time when air conditioning is probably good. But let me challenge you to think in two ways, two ways to approach getting outside. Here's the first one, go big, go big. If you want to understand God, go big. Look at big things, look at the sky, look at the mountains, look at the oceans. There's so much about the nature of God from the big things he's done. Find a place on the beach and pay attention to the oceans. Get up in the mountains and spend some time pondering God. Go out on a starry night and look at the heavens. Try to count the stars in the heavens. Like, go, go big. I would also encourage you to go small. Pause and look at the intricacy of nature. Like, study a flower. Just spend some time studying a flower. Look at what God did. Look at all the intricacies of that. Study a colony of ants. I say that because I've got wood ants that have been eating into my house, and I've been studying them quite <laughs> vociferously, pun intended. Look at a landscape, and just look at the balance of how God's shaped a landscape and put things together, and just ponder God. The biggest challenge that we have with that is we are so used to the noise our lives are filled with constantly taking in information, noise, sound that oftentimes we can't hear. So last summer, Cindy and I did a, a, a sabbatical, and we spent a lot of days really just praying and listening to God, and we spent a lot of days outdoors. And I remember when uh, one of the moments that was so profound to me, uh, I'm sitting in the mountains of North Carolina on a porch of a little cabin looking out over a pond and all of nature around it, and I said to myself, I'm just going to go out there without a book, without a... a, a a course, because I was taking courses, uh, without a course, I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to sit, I'm going to time myself, I'm going to sit here for 45 minutes. So you can imagine. I sat down. And I started to vibrate. 
I'm not doing anything productive. <laughs> like, this is about to kill me. <laughs> and then God spoke. It wasn't an audible voice, but I could hear it in my spirit, just as loud as could be. And God says, here you sit with the creator of the universe for 45 minutes, and you think this is a waste of your time. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> like, I, I realize, like, I have programmed God's voice out of my life. And I chalk that up to the productivity of the world. And it's, it's just pervasive. Like, how many of you have been walking through an airport and somebody's talking as they're walking along beside you? You're like, well, you're not talking to me. You're talking to somebody else. And it's like everywhere you go in the airport, like there are people talking all over the place and you kind of stop. Like, you sit down, somebody talks to you and, talk, and realize like everybody's talking to everybody else, right? Because that's the world that we live in today. We're dialed into the noise. And David said, get outside, look up, listen. Whenever you feel like God is silent, maybe God wants to speak to you through the natural world. But God's got other voices that he speaks in too. Look at verse 7. He says, the law of the Lord. Now let's just pause for a minute. He started off by saying... The heavens declare the glory of God. Now that name for God, El, is the generic name. That's the name that everybody recognizes. But this word for God, Yahweh, is the personal covenant name of God. In other words, God speaks generally through creation to every person on the planet, but he's done something to speak specifically to people who want to know him. This is a much more intimate communication. And so when God seems silent, listen to God's voice in his word. God has communicated to us through his word and in a beautifully poetic way, David gives us descriptions of God's word, what it's like, and the benefit to your life if you'll simply take the Bible and begin to read and listen for God. Look at what he says. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Now, I'm going to describe these things really quickly, so hang in there. Here we go. He starts out with perfect. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The word perfect refers to something that has internal consistency. It's internally consistent. And he says that revives the soul because of anything, we as humans are inconsistent. And what that does is that creates incongruence, which causes all kinds of emotional and psychological and physical breakdown. But if you follow and obey the word of God, listen to it, it gives you a sense of wholeness. It gives you the humanity that you were created to have. He goes on to say, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The word trustworthy here is a word that refers to something that actually is reliable. It works. And so, Giving wisdom, if you do what God says, if you follow his word, listen to him and follow it, you're going to be a wise person. Hey, let's face it, Dave's Ramsey is a household name. You know why? Because he made a lot of money, went broke, decided God's got to have a better way. Opened the Bible, started studying the principles on how to manage and live with money, wrote a course selling that course to millions of people around the world, and guess what it is? It's just straight information out of the Bible applied to our culture today, and he's the smartest money guy around. Many of you benefited from that. How did he come up with that? God. So many people are trying to raise their kids 
following the latest fad in pop psychology. That's going to change in 10 years. It'll be a new fad. How do I know that? Because I've lived through about three of those generations. Instead of simply, what does God say about how to raise kids? Okay, that's wise, trustworthy. The third description is right. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The word right, the idea of righteousness, people doing the right thing. Think about a society where you don't have to worry about somebody coming up and ripping your world apart because people are doing the right thing. That brings joy to the heart. The freedom of not having to worry about being ambushed with something financially, relationally. Somebody pulling the rug out from under you brings joy to the heart. Uh, The next one is my favorite one, actually, personally. He says, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now, let's pause on this for just a second. The commands of the Lord. The commands of the Lord... Like, are you talking about thou shalt and thou shalt not? Aren't the commands of the Lord just there to ruin my freedom and fun? Isn't that what that's for? Like command? Like we don't even, that's kind of a four-letter word in today's culture, right? That's a power word. That's a bad thing. Here's what he says. The commands of the Lord are radiant. The word radiant is the word that means take something that's tarnished and bring back the shine. He says that when God tells us, don't do that and do this instead, what God is doing is he's removing all of the things from our life that actually taint us and ruin us. And he says... Radiant, bringing light to the eyes, which is a Hebrew euphemism for being healthy. Look in a person's eyes. If their eyes are clear, that's telling you what's going on. He's saying the commands of the Lord actually bring psychological and emotional and spiritual and physical health. If we just know what God says and do what God says, radiant. Just a couple more here. He says, the fear of the Lord is pure. The word pure means it's untainted. It doesn't have flaws mixed into it. He says, enduring forever. It's timeless. It's not culturally bound. It's beyond culture. I mean, think about the Bible. Written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors, led by the Holy Spirit. It has internal consistency. Even though it's written in three languages, it was written in different parts of the world by people that had no relationship with each other, and yet it all comes together. It's such an amazing, beautiful, phenomenal, consistent story. When Jesus was explaining to people who he was, he went back to the Old Testament and walked them through specifically who he was, fulfilling hundreds of prophecies. How did that happen? Because the Bible is timeless. Culture's constantly changing. We're constantly recycling broken ideas, and people fall for it as if it's something new. And he's saying, listen, like the Word of God is timeless. Start here. God's speaking to you. Finally, the final one, he says, the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. In other words, you can bank on these things. When you follow the Word of God, listen to the Word of God, read the Word of God, study it, and put it into practice, it will transform every aspect of your life. In fact, he keeps going. He moves on. He says, they're more precious than gold, than much pure gold. What's gold for? It provides security. The Word of God provides security. Having a full bank account doesn't guarantee a full life. But the Word of God does, listening to God's Word and following it. Then he says, they are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Honey was like the best thing in David's day. It would be comparable to like Bluebell in our day. 
minus the listeria, right? <laughs> like that, it's, it's comparable. So what's he talking about? He's saying that the desires that we have are going to be satisfied with the word of God. So it gives us security, it gives us satisfaction. He goes on to say, then by them your servant is warned, we get protection, keeps us from falling off the path or doing something we don't wanna do, and in keeping them there is great reward. In keeping them there's great reward. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, if you want a rewarding life, follow God's plan, listen to his voice, put it into practice, Read the word, study it, follow it, and if you want to be rewarded at the end of your life by God, then listen to God speaking to you through his word. Now, here's my daily practice. My daily practice is I get up, I open the word of God, I raise my hands to heaven, and I say, God, speak to me through your word, your word is truth. And then I dive in. And I've got two questions that I'm working on. The first question is, what are you saying to me today? And I have a place in my journal where I write down God speaking to me from the passage that I'm reading on that day. And then the second question I answer is my application. What, now, what am I going to do with this today? And that's my practice every day is to start the day in the Word of God. Sure, I'm interested in email. Sure, I'm interested in predictions about how the stock market is going to go down again. Sure, I'm interested in whatever terrible thing is happening in Washington. I'm interested in all those things. But you know what? Tomorrow, that news will be the same. I want to know what God wants to say to me today through his word. And when you do that... All of a sudden, the Word of God starts speaking to you in profound and amazing ways. Now, there's one more obstacle that tends to get in the way, and that obstacle is a real one. And so, hearing from God, you want to really hear from God, you've got to invite God to speak into your struggles. Invite God to speak into your struggles. So, um, it was the year 2006. I got diagnosed with tongue cancer. I went in and had surgery to remove it. And here we are in 2022. And I went to my doctor to have my annual checkup. And he said, why are you coming back? And I said, because you need the money. <laughs> Isn't that why we go to the doctor, right? They need the money. So he said, no, no. He said, you don't need to come back. So praise God. Like he said, don't come back anymore. So I'm not coming back anymore to the doctor. So that's kind of a, that's a real praise from my standpoint. But I learned something profound during the time. So I, like I was all sewed up and I, like I had all, all these, de these deals. And it, I, I first started on the Etch-A-Sketch, you know, trying to write things and have the family read them. And like that didn't work because as soon as you pointed up at them, it erases half of it. And so like, anyway, that wasn't working. And so then I just figured I'd bite the bullet, literally, and I would just like try to say stuff. So I would talk. And, and what happened was in, invariably, no matter who was around, what I discovered is every time I said something, I would get back, uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I wasn't as clear my voice wasn't as clear as it is now, so no, no blame, no shame on anybody that's in the room. But I would get that back, and so I would say it again. And I realized after a while, like, I, I have to repeat everything. And then one day, I just kind of got mad. I know it's hard to believe. And I just didn't respond to the what, and guess what? About 30 seconds later, I got a response to my original question. And here's what I came to understand about myself and about all of us. It's not that we often don't hear. It's that we don't listen because what's going on in front of us takes our attention. So we're busy. And so the struggles and the difficulties, the things that are going on with us, oftentimes 
actually get in the way when God is already speaking to us. So David says this really important statement. In verse 12, he says, who can discern his errors? Now, this is a question you have to ask yourself. Do I truly believe that God knows what he's doing and he's error-free, not only in the way that he deals with the universe, but the way he deals with me? Because as long as you believe that you are right, and therefore if it's not working out the way you want to, or if you're not hearing God in the way you want to hear him, that he must be messing up, then it actually doesn't matter if he speaks to you because you're not necessarily going to trust what he has to say. So that's something that when it comes to the struggle is the faith struggle. Do I actually believe that God knows what he's doing? Real important question. And that's a determiner on how your whole life is going to go. So you have to ask yourself that over and over again. Do I really believe that God knows what he's doing or do I think I'm better at figuring out my world and my universe and this universe than he is. Pastor Tim Keller told a story about when he was young. He fell madly in love with a girl, asked her out, they started dating, and he was convinced that she was the one. He had to marry this girl. She was not. She kept trying to break up with him. Like some of you ladies, you've had one of those guys, right? Maybe you actually married him. I don't know. But anyway, he was convinced. And so for a year, he kept this thing going. And every day he would pray, God, don't let her break up with me. She's the one. Don't let her break up. He actually moved to be closer to her because he felt like God couldn't handle the, the distance in the geography. So he actually uprooted and moved to be closer to where she lived, thinking God would handle it. Well, she did break up with him. Life moved on. Years later, looking back, he thought, well, that would have been a terrible mistake. God protected me from doing that crazy thing. And he came to understand that here's how God responds. Responded to him and responds. So if you're my child, God says, then I'm going to answer the prayer that you would have prayed if you knew what I know. Isn't that interesting? God's only going to answer prayers that are actually what's best for you. Sometimes we have another idea, and that's why we can't hear, not because we can't hear him speaking, but because we don't want to hear what he's saying. And so David points out two areas where we struggle. He says, forgive my hidden faults. Sometimes there's stuff going on inside of us that we don't even know about, that are taking us off the path that are taking us down the wrong road, they're getting us confused and messing us up. And David actually acknowledges there may be stuff going on in me that I don't even have a knowledge of that's unhealthy and it's not working. God, help me in that place. Pray that prayer. Don't assume that you have you figured out. Pray that prayer. Secondly, David says, keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. There are things that each of us choose to do that we know are not best. They're not right. And if we continue to do those, they become the God in our lives. We become enslaved to those things. And then our prayers are all around, bless this God in my life. And God just says, I'm not going to do that because I don't want you to be in bondage to a passion, a desire, a need for approval, some kind of success dream that you've got to have, feeding a craving that's a habit that's become addictive, that's dangerous. Like, I'm not going to keep feeding that. And David said, "I I want you to actually kind of steer me away, open my heart that I don't get involved in sins that I choose to get involved in that actually become master to me. He says, 
then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. And then he closes the psalm with these incredible words. He says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. My rock, my stability, and my redeemer, the one who buys me back and saves me. Now, this is such a beautiful verse because literally what he's saying is is that I will get past my struggles by moving into you in such a way that as the heavens are speaking, as the word of God is speaking, may I be speaking, let the words of my mouth And as the heavens are showing, as the word of God is showing, let the meditation of my heart, what I am meditating on, let that show that I am synced up with you. In fact, that's the spiritual practice that I'm going to encourage you to do this week. So the spiritual practice is this. Memorize Psalm 1914. That last verse that we just looked at, what I would encourage you to do right now is mark it in your Bible, pin it on your phone, take a picture of it, put it someplace where you can come back to it. And what we're encouraging you to do is to make it a prayer back to God every day this week. So while you're memorizing it, you don't have to memorize it to pray it, but while you're memorizing it over the course of the week, just as you look at it each day and put it through your mind, turn it into a prayer and pray it back to God. And as you pray that back to God, I believe that God is going to begin to open up your mind and your ears and your heart to hear him in a new and profound way. God has spoken to us and is speaking through nature. Get outdoors. Think about it. Take the time to ponder it. Shut it off so you can experience it. God is speaking through his word. Open it. Read it. Listen to it. Obey it. Put it into your life. What David didn't have that you have is God took Jesus as the word incarnate and sent him as the final word. What? Like, we have the person of Jesus that through his life, his death, his resurrection said, if you didn't get it from nature and you didn't get it from the word, I'm just going to come and I'm going to make sure you know who I am. What an awesome, awesome opportunity. I just have to say, when I hear God's silence, I start with me. Like, what's getting in the way? Because I believe that God wants to talk to you, that he is talking to you. And even though it might not be exactly the way you want, just be patient, and you're going to hear from God. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, I just thank you for this wonderful psalm. I thank you for the opportunity we have to just unpack it together. Father, may it change us. May we, this week, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. I pray that each person who's listening today would be transformed this week through your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.